Hello. Are you interested in radio? Me neither. I must say, I think radio is dead. But, uh, yeah, what, what are we talking about? On the other hand, you have podcasts and things like that. But, but radio in itself, I think, uh, at least where I live, it has become something you turn on if you have forgotten your smartphone or MP3 player or whatever. YouTube is not there and you, you can't listen to a podcast. So you turn on the radio and it plays music you kind of like and uh, talks maybe about local news or th things like that. So it's okay that it's there, but there was a time when all this was different. When radios looked like this. And when you turned them on, you would bring the world into your home. And you would sit down together with your family and listen to things. Let's listen to some of the sounds of that era. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Lights out, everybody. Who knows? What evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow Knows. <laughs> Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. The National Broadcasting Company presents Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 13. Andy, did you hear that? Come on, will you? Did I hear what? That whistle. <whistles> That's the Rinso White whistle. The Manson. I was a communist for the FBI. Dark fantasy. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Six table, I'm on the street. Makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee bring you Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Mortimer Snurd with Ray Noble and his orchestra, Joan Merrill, yours truly, Jim Amici, and Charlie's special guest, Orson Welles. Gunsmoke. Lux presents Hollywood. The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. It's the Martin and Lewis Show. I must say that has a feeling to it that neither television nor the internet would, would, would ever bring back again. Uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but I think the, the idea of closing your eyes and listening to voices that are charismatic, uh, that are, are authoritative, that, that, that are performing, that, that are artists, you know, can create in your mind so, so many places, so many pictures, so many situations, so many things, uh, and they are all yours because you take part in creating them. So audio dramas and audio books and even today like 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 podcasts and so on are a thing uh like like no other. Um but here today we are talking about the time when radio was quite new and it was the first time that sounds like this entered your home and brought you the world in a time when when many people couldn't travel so much and there was no television maybe there was uh maybe there was uh, the, the silver screen right there was cinema and so on but um yeah you had to go out for that and you you dressed nicely and 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 spend a whole day uh preparing for it maybe and then you return things like that but but being in your house listening to the radio at at a certain time frame in our in our world, was, uh, I suppose, the most beautiful thing you could imagine. 
especially in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hard time like uh, in the Second World War and so on. Today I have three books about old-time radio. And the first one is, is this, which has a wonderful title. It's called Raised on Radio. But no, in fact it is called Raised on Radio in Quest of the Lone Ranger, Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, The Shadow, Mary Noble, The Great Gildersleeve, Fibber McGee and Molly, Bill Stern, Our Miss Brooks, Henry Aldrich, The Quiz Kids, Mr. First Nighter, Fred Allen, Vic and Sade, Jack Armstrong, Arthur Godfrey, Bob and Ray, The Barber Family, Henry Morgan, Our Girl Sunday, Joe Friday, and other lost heroes from Radio's heyday. If you have heard none of these names before, then you're not alone, definitely. But uh, that means you have never heard about old-time radio. So, talking about the time when radio was what I, what I just tried to describe there. Um, yeah, and, and The Lone Ranger, I think, is the one thing that might be known today. But usually people think it's a TV show from the 1950s. Even fewer people think it's a film with Johnny Depp uh, because nobody saw it. Um, yeah, but all the other things I think are part of a time that's that's forgotten. And uh, there are some people out there in uh, in the world and on the internet who love these things, archive these things for some horrible reason. I think people started digitalizing these old shows from. God knows what kind of tapes and so on they had uh, at a time when the when the download rate the bandwidth was so limited that they are oh, they, they sound horrible and so uh, today you can find a lot of these old shows on certain in, in, from certain sources but um, you cannot find them in, in good quality and a lot of these these shows that we know about of course, we're lost, you know, like like uh, old Doctor Who uh, episodes, some of them, and so on. As you can see, the book uh, doesn't have many pictures, so it's not this this kind of video where I leave through it. Uh, actually, only each um, chapter begins with 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 one or two pictures, uh, showing people we don't know. Even if you're a big fan of old time radio, you won't know the people because you never saw their faces. If you're a total insider, if you're into old Hollywood or old music uh, of the time, if you're a jazz fan of the swing era, even amongst jazz fans, there are not so many swing fans I, I, I've learned. Um, then you might know some of the people, but it's 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 so hard. There, there weren't films being made about that, except of course much much later, Woody Allen's Radio Days, which is a wonderful film, and you should watch it whether you're interested in the stuff or not. It's it's such a great film about the the, the past, about life, about about everything. Um, yes, uh, this book is uh, is divided into chapters that somehow give you an idea of um, the history. It's not historically sorted, but you get something about jokes, about um, uh, about vaudeville, the, because most of the comedy in, in this era came from vaudeville. I think vaudeville was still a thing when radio came up, and so uh, standing in front of an audience and telling jokes was a thing that you started in vaudeville in the 19th century probably uh, became popular in the in the up to the 20s then radio came it, it started there and then it slowly slowly faded into like like musicals uh, of, of the, the 50s and and so on and then yeah what what is it today do we have what will i i don't know i don't think we have we later we had stand-up comedy and from that time on as you can see in the simpsons if you you see what how crusty the clown is portrayed he's like an old-fashioned vaudeville comedian who cannot uh yeah who, who cannot change who, who cannot update his humor and so becomes a tv clown for children yeah um uh, saddle sore here's something about the westerns that existed and so on no wasps need apply 
and a voice of another color. Uh, it's quite interesting, of course, uh, in those days, what uh, what we call minorities today and what in those days might have been minorities, but might have been just part of the flow of people, damn it. Um, yeah, what, what, what happened there? Just like with jazz music, right? Uh, even if you were the biggest racist you could imagine, you would probably come across black uh, comedians, black uh, comedy, bla black black artists, music and stuff like that. And uh, Jewish people and so on all, all had their impact here because, of, of course, with voices and so on. It wasn't like the BBC, right? American radio was not like like Britain where you even invented a uh, general kind of BBC English that everybody should should speak. Uh, although, of course, England also had their love for the working class and uh, people talking like this. Uh, I'm sorry, blimey, squire, I can't do it. Um, and and uh, has, a, has, a, has a long history of radio uh, to Britain. But uh, in, in, in America... Um, you, you, you had people from different backgrounds, real, real multiculturalism, if you want, and it mirrored, uh, it was mirrored in, on the radio, right? More that, more so than, than in, in, in books and magazines at the time. So there's something about that here. And of course, um, of course about something that is, is totally unacceptable today and totally, uh, forbidden, and that is uh, what you would call uh, black-faced voices, because Amos and Andy was uh, one of the most influential and successful shows for a long, long time. But it was white men speaking black men in a stereotypical way. And uh, I've, I've heard that there was even a film where they wore blackface and so on. Sorry, kill me, but I'm interested in that. And I am. I would argue that these things did not just destroy the, the 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 dignity of black people by these stereotypes but created in the 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 society of that era of people listening to the radio created some kind of positive attitude towards black people even if they weren't played by black people you know what i mean but write me in the comments if you hate me for that uh, tell youtube to cancel this video uh, that's the way i feel and uh, if you have arguments against that, yeah, let me know. Um, yeah, there's uh, something about Radio Noir, you know, like 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 Rubbers and Soap Factory and Royal Family, uh, probably about the, the, the biggest names here. Uh, Crunch, Creek, Crash, Whoosh, Wham, and Woo! Uh, is something about the uh, making of sound effects and so on. So, a lot of nice little uh, chapters uh, and, and quite quite big, right? How many pages are these? Uh, this is like like uh, 500 pages or something with a long bibliography. That's nice. And a wonderfully long index. I must say in, in books like this, I, I love that. Because the regular way would be you come across uh, uh, an old-time radio show on the internet or wait for the Easter egg after this video and uh, might get interested in, in something. Um, and then you can look it up and, and hope to find it in the book. It's quite difficult, I must say, because there's so much. We are talking about decades of, 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 uh, of programs being produced that it's really, really difficult to find exactly what you want. And it took me, when I started to discover this on the internet some time ago, it took me a few months until I could could see the difference between British and American and, and the different eras. Me being a big horror fan, uh, of course, I was looking for uh, horror stories most of all. And even there, I, I could see there there there's some some big names and some smaller names. I'll, I'll talk about this later, maybe. Um, but it, it takes some some months to get into that. But it's it's worth it, right? It's like discovering uh, an era of film. Like like silent films or, or musicals, uh, MGM musicals, and you have you have a whole world ahead of you to discover. Maybe a better introduction to the whole topic is Leonard Maltin's um, book called "Great American Broadcast." This book uh, is is much more, uh, yeah, pub pub popularly cultural has more pictures <laughs> that's that's a thing right uh, and a lot of very interesting pictures int from from people working uh, on the radio and and, and so on um, again a lot of uh, people you don't know and the pictures are not as extensive as I I would like 
gee, if there was a coffee table art book, because y y you get an idea, you could print pages from scripts, you could uh, find uh, publicity pictures from, from advertising and so on. You could find pictures from people joking while they r record or recording studios and so on. Please, if, if there's anybody out there, make a coffee table book uh, with all the pictures you can find uh, of, of Jack Benny and so on. I mean, my God, a lot of these things that started on radio, like Jack Benny, um, and, and Ozzy and Harriet, for example, uh, bled over into television. And there's the, the Jack Benny Joe on television. If you don't know who Jack Benny is, I can't put all, all this into this one show here. <laughs> show. Sorry. To this one video clip here. Um, but believe me, um, it's worth finding out. Right? Because if you, if you like, for example, comedy films of the seventies, like Mel Brooks films and, and so on, or Jerry Lewis, uh, there's, there's so much from that time, uh, cameos and, and appearances of, of, of people like Jack Benny. Uh, and if you don't know anything about them, uh, yeah, that's, um, that can be a problem to, to find it funny and to laugh about it. Would be even be called cringy, maybe. But, but isn't it the same with, if you, if you look at some 80s, uh, shows or, or comedies? Yeah. Like, like, like 80s films and suddenly Dr. Ruth Westheimer comes in and everybody would have laughed in the, in the 80s. And no, today nobody knows who she is. She's even alive. I think I, I, I can't believe it, but I, I've Googled what she's doing now and she's not a thing anymore, but, uh, God bless her. I would say, uh, Malton's book. Has a different style of writing. It's it's not as um, factual as the other one, not filled with with facts, but instead uh, go gives you more an idea of what it meant to be alive in those days and probably to work on radio. Yeah, that's that's how I would put it. Signing on, writing for radio, directors, sound effects, and effects of sound. Uh, skill and art radio acting, the announcer, and now a word about sponsors. Seriously, audience, actors, live, yeah. Audiences, by the way, a lot of the uh, radio shows were produced live, in front of a live audience. And uh, if, if you, if, later, um, they were recorded uh, or transcribed, as they said, and then you, it's quite interesting. Then you, then you had uh, on the West Coast and on the East Coast different recordings of the same script and, and so on. It's, it's really fascinating, I must say. And uh, don't forget, whatever I, 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 I say here about the history and so on, uh, nothing beats really listening to something. So please, check out uh, a show. You know, like, like a variety show, like, like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the Bing Crosby show or something where you have music and, and, and so on. And Frank Sinatra singing and so on. Check out, uh, some, some crime or mystery, uh, program. Check out a comedy program. Yeah. Uh, maybe I put something in the links as, as, as starting points. But if you really want to get a feeling for, for this, uh, listen to some of these things. And, uh, if you like it, uh, this book would be a good place to start to get some idea about the time uh, and so on. By the way, I I fear, I really have the fear, I'm talking a lot about politics today, right? But about if the zeitgeist of, of social justice and cancel culture and so on. I really fear that if if a book is written about that era at all, it will be full of apologies for things we shouldn't apologize for. Yeah? Like, like, like Amos and Andy and so on. And, and, and the war, you know, if, how could they have made, uh, entertaining programs for soldiers fighting? You know, we're talking about the Second World War. Yeah. We're, we're talking about people fighting the Nazis, the real, the literal Nazis, but still people would be angry about, uh, I don't know, uh, May West, uh, or whoever, you know, making jokes for, for the guys, uh, on the front. Um, yeah, uh, look out for some, some radio shows, uh, some, some, some radio shows for soldiers as well. It's quite, quite heartwarming and touching actually, especially like, like, uh, Christmas shows, you know, for them and, and so on. Um, easy to find on YouTube actually. Just uh, type OTR and you will find it. Uh, great book to get, uh, to get the basic background information. The other book is great for, I would, I'll talk about it in the end.
as always. The last book I have is really a biggie. Yes. This is actually the... Oh, the encyclopedia of old-time radio. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, as you can see, it's, it's hardcover, well-bound and, and printed and, 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 and so on. This is, of course, for the, um, yeah, the, the, the geeks, the nerds, the people who were stung by the, by the bug, by the OTR bug. Um, as, as the name says, this is an encyclopedia full of information and names of programs. As you can see, it's uh, American novels, the adventures of Superman, I saw, um, eh, the, the notorious Amos and Andy, probably, auction gallery. So this here gives you an idea of, of uh, what existed. Just like television later, there was a lot of, uh, like, like, like shows on the internet, like call-in shows. Oh my god, I'm just remembering, uh, Groucho Marx, you know, his, his, like, like, game and, and talk show, uh, where, which also existed on, on early television and so on, uh, which consisted of games, you know, playing with, uh, but no, it didn't. It was like a game show, but in fact, it was just Groucho talking to people. If, if I had only one thing, if I could do one thing for the rest of my life in a, in a single room with, with enough food, I would just listen to Groucho talking to people, I suppose. And, um, yeah, as you can see here, no pictures at all, but, uh, uh the Breakfast Club, not the 80s movie, by the way, um, of, uh, yeah, lists of films and just enough information so you get an idea of what all this was about. So, um, I would argue that, um, if you've, if you've read Malton's book, for example, and, uh, really, really find that you enjoy this and spend some time checking out old, old time radio on, on n not just, uh, YouTube video here and there, but also on the, like, like archive.com and downloading and f trying to find the best, uh, available versions of, uh, your favorite shows. And you try to find new shows all the time. Then this book is, is a good, way to to see what you can can look for what makes me a bit sad of course is the idea that a lot of these uh, that, that a lot of the shows mentioned here don't exist anymore as recordings as transcriptions as they would have said that a lot of these things are lost and i mean the same of course goes for for television you know i, I would love to have 24 hours of television from the 1970s, from, from my childhood, including all the commercials, all the boring news and the, the interviews and, and, and so on. I would love to have like, like that, right? But I, I admit that I think the, the value of, of something like, like Jeopardy, of old Jeopardy shows, that the value is not as as big as the value of of uh, recordings of this era, because it turns out that as soon as you put people, real, 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 like like pedestrians in some some talk shows or um, like like audience members uh, in front of a in front of a microphone in those days, uh, they gave you. They, they are great for, if you're interested in language, then the development of language. If you're a linguist, right, you have to listen to old time radio shows because it gives you an idea of how they talked. They were not used to mass media and, and so on. And so they talk in totally different ways. And I don't know if, uh, after the 1980s, probably from the 1990s on, uh, if, if, if you get a lot of interesting information besides, oh, the funny hairdos of people in, in, in those eras. As you can see, an, an extensive index, which is always, always nice. Um, yeah. And so this book is really for you. If you, uh, say this should be part of my life, I'm interested in what, what was and what will never be again. Because I wonder, could you make an encyclopedia like this for today's radio world? 
or even for today's television world, yes, of course you can. Um, but how interesting will it be? Uh, I think people my age today, uh, people, people who look back on the 70s and 80s will remember their old favorite shows, uh, TV shows and even radio shows, maybe, I don't know. Um, and, and they look back and think, oh yeah, that was, it was a good time. Will that happen in 40 years? Will people look through TikTok videos from 2020? And say, oh yeah, that was that era of TikTok. I still remember that. Oh, it was so uh, deep and so profound uh, in those days. Look at what has happened now. You know, if uh, TikTok two uh, has has come out in in forty years, what the, will that be? Like like six second video clips with so much information that your brain explodes and people say, oh, that was funny. Will it be like idiocracy? I don't know. I'm not even arguing that the, the programs from, from this time are all profound, mind, mind me. It's, it's more that I think there was experimentation there. There was a lack of cynicism. There was great optimism in those days. There was a, uh, there, there were people trying to entertain an audience and inform an audience and inspire an audience where today i don't know what some programs uh, see as their their mission in life is it is it entertaining is it p propaganda i i don't know uh, i won't i won't finish on a on a political level but um if you if you're interested in old time radio this book is definitely uh, something to go for if you like reading more about the time this is is the thing to have and if you say i don't want to get too much into detail i just want to know what was there uh th that's a good thing next to uh, a lot of uh, yeah home pages about it and archives and so on bless everybody in the old days of radio bless the voices they will still be with me in the future and uh, if you stay till after this clip is over, I will put in a little Easter egg. If it turns out that YouTube sees that as a copyright problem, I won't, or I will put in something else. But anyway, I don't want you to end with my voice, but to end with voices from a wonderful past. <music> And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of the Shadow People. Elaine, have you been. I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope. <laughs> it came from upstairs. Come on. Oh. You don't I don't know what anything. to think. I only hope that... Oh, David. David, if anything's happened to him... I'm... We'll see in a moment. There's no light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David. What's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Shadow People. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Shadow People. Somewhere along the line of your life, you've met them. 
you have come in contact with the shadow people. When did we first discuss it? Oh, yes, Brian and Elaine and I. It was in my apartment. There was only one light on in the entire place. Oh. What's wrong? Oh. Elaine, what's the matter? Oh, it, it, it's silly, I know, but I, I, I thought I saw something in that doorway over there. Where? Over there, right over there. Where are you going, David? Over to that archway, just to let you know that nothing's here. Huh. You see, Elaine, nothing's wrong, nothing at all. Are you satisfied that there's no one else here but us? Yes, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought that I... Leave the overhead lights on. I'm sorry. I thought that... Put them back on, David, please. All right, Elaine. Look, what's bothering you, sis? I don't know. It's just that... I don't know. Tell us about it, Elaine. Tell us what's bothering you. You promise that you... You won't laugh at me? Of course not. Brian? Oh, Elaine, I'm your brother. If something's troubling you, uh, I'd like to know about it. All right, then. The reason I was so upset was the fact that I saw someone or something standing in that archway. But Elaine, David showed you that there was no one else in here. When the lights were put on, you saw for yourself that we were alone. I'm not talking about something you you can see in the light, Brian. I'm not talking about a human being. Then what's it all about, Elaine? In the darkness, I, I saw something that can't be seen in a lighted area. And I've seen it several times before. You're sure you're not imagining this, Elaine? Oh, I don't have that good an imagination, Brian. How long have you... Have you seen this thing, Elaine? Well, it... It started about six weeks ago. You were in Detroit on business, Brian. Mom and Dad were on vacation. I was in the house by myself. In the library. There was only one light on. I sat in the chair beneath it, reading. Several times I thought that something was watching me. I felt there was someone in the room with me, standing right in back of me. Every so often, I'd glance back over my shoulder, but there seemed to be nothing there. And then, then I thought I heard someone whispering. I wasn't sure, but when I heard it again, I got up and I, I, I looked all over the house. Oh, I'm not easily frightened, you know that, but, but out in the hallway... It was almost entirely black. Luckily, I was near a light switch. I looked back over my shoulder, and, and I saw this huge, hulking shape for the first time. And I heard a voice. Or rather, the whisper of a voice. I couldn't distinguish the words, but that dark shape seemed to be moving towards me. My hand was on the light switch, and I turned it on. In a minute, the light flooded the hallway. The shape was gone. There was nothing there. I was alone again. As long as there's light, I know it can't hurt me. I know it can't reach me. You might have imagined it, you know. Of course, that's possible, but I'm sure I didn't. It was so real. So real, that shape in the darkness. It was the very essence of evil itself. <laughs> There was an old man I knew of, a Dr. Hesedius. I'd heard that he knew quite a good deal about the supposed supernatural manifestations which had taken place in the world. I went to him to see if he knew anything that might explain the events of the story Elaine had told us. Yes, my good sir. What do you wish? I have an appointment with Dr. Hesedius. Oh, yes, yes. He mentioned something about it. You are Mr. Drake. Yes. I if you'll come inside. Thank you. Dr. Hesedius is in the study. Please come with me. Doctor? A visitor for you? Oh, yes. Bring him in. You may go now. Yes, Doctor. Mr. Drake? Yes. Sit down, please, in that chair over there. Thank you, sir. Now, what is the nature of your visit to me? Well, I understand, Dr. Vesedius, that you have a great knowledge of the supernatural manifestations which have occurred on the earth. Great knowledge, Mr. Drake? No, hardly that. I have only scratched the surface in my years of study. 
Perhaps I can help you. Then again, perhaps I cannot. Well, may I tell you the story? By all means, my good sir. All right. Now, this didn't happen to me, Doctor, but to my fiancée. It seems that about six weeks ago, when she was alone, when the light was on, the dark form disappeared. And that's the story, sir. As much of it as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I see. It's a strange tale you tell. I'm fully aware of that, Dr. Decebius. You say she seemed to hear whispered voices? Yes, that's what she says. I see. A moment, please. I have a book in my file. Oh, yes. Here it is. I think this is the one. Yes. Perhaps I may be able to help you after all. Let me see. This is a very ancient book, Mr. Drake. I seem to remember... Yes. Here is an account of a happening such as you relate. And we shall live on the earth and they, they shall not, not see us. Yes. yes, it has been foretold by the ruler of the darkness. They who live by day retire to sleep by night shall never know that we walk with them, that we watch them, that we wait for our chance. Only in the night will they see us, for in the daylight we are not seen. Only in the night, when the darkness grows together and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness, they will know us. Then they will know that we are their companions, for we are the shadow people. I knew I had read something similar to the story you have told me, Mr. Drake. Dr. Asilius, what can we do? Well, give me a little time. Let me see if I can find any more references to these uh, people of the darkness. One more thing, Mr. Drake. Yes. Be sure that your fiancé is never left alone at night. Be sure that there is some living thing, animal or human, which accompanies her every second of the night. For she is in danger, Mr. Drake. A terrible danger. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. That night, the night of the day I had seen Hesselius, Elaine's mother died. She died in her sleep. When she failed to appear for breakfast, Elaine's father went upstairs to see what was wrong. When he entered her room, he discovered that she was dead. The family doctor couldn't explain it, for Elaine's mother had been in perfect health. A few weeks later, I was out of the house spending a weekend with him. I glanced at the clock on the mantel, and it showed eleven. I can't understand why Brian hasn't returned from town. Well, he said he had some extra work to catch up on. He told me this morning that he might be late. Well, eleven o'clock, I'm going upstairs. Glad you came out, David. Good seeing you again. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Well, don't stay up too late. See you both in the morning. Night. Good night, Dad. Good night, Mr. Davis. He isn't the same, David. Ever since Mother died, he hasn't been the same. I didn't realize that until tonight. He's changed. I only hope that he'll start living again. Ever since she died, it, it seems that a part of him died with her. Elaine, have you been... I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope... <laughs> It came from upstairs. Come on. You don't think... I don't know what to think. I only hope that... David, David if anything happened to him... We'll see you in a moment. There's no light in his room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David, what's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Father's dead, Elaine. <laughs> I'd walked into the darkened bedroom. On the bed was Elaine's father. It didn't take a second look for me to note that he was dead. 
I switched off the light and walked back into the hallway to tell Elaine what happened. And then from the room there had come an eerie, quiet laughter. In the darkness of that room was some unknown evil power. The voice itself was unearthly. There was no substance to it. It sounded as if... as if it came from the darkness itself. No. No, I don't believe you. It's the truth, Elaine. There's nothing more I can do. We'll have to notify the police. Tell me it's not the truth, David. Tell me it's not true. I'm sorry, Elaine. I wish I could. <laughs> Your father's dead. After the burial, Dr. Hesselius got in touch with me. He said that he wanted to meet both Elaine and Brian, that he wanted to talk to the three of us. Accordingly, a few nights later, he came out to their house. Miss Davis, will you tell me just when you saw the first manifestation? The night Brian was in Detroit. Now, Miss Davis, you have even seen this apparition in the company of other people, is that correct? Yes. The night at David's apartment. All right. Now I'll tell you what I think. You are in deadly danger, Miss Davis. These beings want to claim you. So far, they have had no success. Only in the darkness do they have power. Little by little, step by step, they have been removing the obstacles in their way to reaching you. First your mother, and then your father, Miss Davis. Both died in the same fashion. In the darkness, death struck at them. Now tell me, do you feel their presence here in this room as I talk to you? Yes. Turn out the lights, Brian. But, no. Stand by the switch, if you please, Brian. If anything happens, turn the lights back on. All right. Dr. Vesilius, I don't... Do think... you want me to continue working with you? Yes, sir. All right, then. Brian, turn off the lights. Yes, Doctor. The room now is in darkness, Miss Davis. Do you feel or see anything? No, I... Yes. Yes, I do. Do you see anything? Yes. Doctor, I don't... Be quiet, you fool. I know what I'm doing. In front of me. The darkness gathering together into a huge, terrible... Not only do you see us, Miss Davis, but everyone else in the room also will see the vague shapes forming themselves in the blackness. We do not want you, Dr. Hesselius. The girl we want. We advise you to drop this case. You will only bring down the wrath of the shadow people upon your head. The girl. We want the girl. Do not stop us. Let us take her now. Turn on the light. They're gone. Miss Davis, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Just as she said. The darkness. I, I saw it form into something, too. So did I. What are we going to do, Dr. Hesselius? At the present moment, I don't know. But this much I do know. You must leave this house immediately. You must try to get out of their reach. I don't know if that is possible. I hope it is. I shall have to return to my home. I must learn if there is some manner by which we can defeat these creatures. For the moment, leave this house. Dispose of it. In any manner you may see fit, but leave this house. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. We spent the night in my apartment, the three of us. The following day, Brian and Elaine made arrangements to dispose of the house. In the afternoon, Dr. Hesselius called me and asked that I come to see him. David, I'm glad you're here. Anything new, Doctor? Yes and no. You realize, of course, that this spiritual manifestation is not new, that it has gone on for centuries. No, I wasn't aware of that. It's true, David. De Maupassant wrote uh, what was supposedly a fiction story about the manifestation, David. He called it uh, the Orla. However, according to the information here on my desk, it was taken from an actual case history. Of course, he embroidered the story, added a few touches to something he didn't realize actually existed. But have you found anything with which we can fight them? Everything depends upon an answer I received from a colleague of mine in Paris, Dr. Henri Renault. 
I dispatched a telegram to him last night. Well, why hasn't he answered by now? There are certain things that must be done. It will take a few days, I'm afraid. We have to wait, David. There's nothing else we can do. In the next few days, the house was sold, and Brian and Elaine moved into a newer, more modern home a few miles from my apartment. Cecilia said it might take a few days for them to build up their power. I spent the nights at the new house. The lights were left on, and I watched for any unusual occurrence. In the daytime, I'd return to my apartment and get some sleep. About four days after Elaine and Brian moved into the new house, I was at home when Hesedius phoned me. Hello? David? Yes, Dr. Hesedius? I hate to tell you this, David. What's the matter? What's wrong? They were a step ahead of me, David. I just received word that Renault died or was killed. At the very moment I sent the telegram to him. Step by step, they had outwitted us. For they had anticipated every move we'd make. Even Dr. Hesedius was at a loss as to what to do. He agreed to meet me at the Davis house. What did you want to see us about, Dr. Hesedius? Did you find out anything more? I'm sorry to say that I haven't. At the moment, I'm at a complete loss. I don't know what to do. But what did you want to see us about this evening? Merely to check, to see if anything else has happened. Miss Davis, have you seen or heard anything? Not in the house, only in my dreams. Your dreams? Yes. When I go to sleep at night, in my dreams, in the darkness, I see them. And it's grown worse, much worse. I was hoping that it would not have progressed so far. There has been no disturbance in this house, but now they disturb your sleep, Miss Davis. Now, you must stay awake for as long as you can. I want the three of you to move into my house. Perhaps that will give you more protection. That night, we moved over to the Cedius house. Perhaps Elaine would have more protection there. From there, we might be able to devise some plan of action, some way to beat those beings. For a few days, things were quiet. The shadow people seemed to have withdrawn. For a while, I thought that we might have succeeded in thwarting their purpose. Elaine no longer complained of troubled sleep. But that condition lasted for a few days only. About ten days later, they made themselves known and felt again. That night, we were in the study. And suddenly, Hesedius whirled around and... Elaine, what are you looking at? Outside the house. Right where the light leaves off, I see them. She's right, Dr. Hesedius. I can see them, too. What should we do, Doctor? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? There's nothing we can do. We can't just... We can't do anything, Brian. Don't you understand that they have us at their mercy? Greatest man in my field was Henri Renault. If he could do nothing against them, what do you think we can do? He's right, Brian. There's nothing we can do. As long as the house remains lighted... Just so long will they remain outside. If the lights were... <laughs> that sounds... Like... The night father was killed. The same sound we heard, the same sound. The lights. What happened to oh, the lights? I don't know. Be quiet, either. please. I thought of this emergency. A candle. That's right, Miss Davis. As long as this burns, this one candle will be safe. For they cannot advance into the light. They are limited by the darkness. As long as the candle burns, they will have to remain outside of this room. <laughs> Around you, in every room of the house, in the darkness outside, we are around you. This time you shall not escape. This time we will claim you. Take it easy, Brian. I, I can't stand it. Brian, come back. Don't be a fool. I'm going after him. Stay here. We just can't let him go. He won't have a chance. I doubt it. (laughs) Miss Davis, I'm afraid that your brother is dead. (laughs) The wind, Doctor. Listen to the wind. I know. Yes, Doctor. Listen. 
listen to the wind. You must realize by now that the three of you haven't a chance. You must know in your minds that we can destroy you at any moment we desire. But, Dr. Hesselius, you may still save your own life. Let the others go. Give them to us. No. No, you will have to take all of us. Shall we destroy your light? Shall we move in on you now? <laughs> as you will. Do as you will. I'm sorry, David. The candle is out. portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs>